Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Salt Water for the Soul. You are here with me, Mandy Elam of Sea Goddess Healing Arts, and I'm here with my incredible friend and beautiful soul family member, Denise Russo. She is an incredible, expressive art facilitator, among many, many other things. And she's been a beautiful member of our community and classes for a while now. Some things I've learned so far from Denise are about discipline and relearning and coming into your real and understanding some of your PTSD, working with spirit animals and this incredible thing she calls the Shid Master, which we will definitely talk about. So as y'all know, salt water for the soul. Sometimes, you know, it stings a little bit to flush out of a wound. Sometimes salt water helps with that. And Denise has a lot of experience in these topics. Welcome, Denise. I'm so happy you're here to chat with me. I'm happy to be here too. Thank you for having me. Of course, <laughs> truly, truly our honor. So I would love it if you would share a little bit about yourself. Obviously, you are an amazing expressive art facilitator and wonderful creator of many things, and you teach all kinds of stuff. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I don't know where you want me to begin. Um, I didn't have a very, um, an easy time growing up. And um, I was born in the night 1954 so you know the the family was was very different than it is today it was a nuclear family very few people were divorced um the american dream was the goal of most families um but there was also a lot of um there was a lot of unhappiness too um a lot of men had come back from the war. Mental health was not discussed. So, you know, um, it was never talked about. So feelings were never talked about. And there was a lot of alcohol abuse. And um, that was the case in my home. And it, it was very violent. Um, I never really questioned it because you didn't talk about it. I mean, I always felt different. I always felt like I never fit in. Um, I always joke about when I walked into a room, I always wanted to be an old, bo an old boy but because I was always an oh no and eventually settled for an oh well. And that was um, because I, I fought against the dysfunction. I wanted to understand why. I wanted to understand people. I wanted people to be happy. I didn't enjoy the tension and the sadness. And from as, as long as I can remember, I've always been interested in sociology, psychology, anthropology, um, and just what makes, makes humans tick. Um, and, um, yeah, it was a it was a rough ride, and and I didn't have the strength, so I I became an alcoholic. I was an alcoholic for forty years, and I just celebrated seven years. And that may not sound like a lot to some people, but it's something I never thought that I would ever see ever. And during it's amazing. And deserve a big Denise likes to give standing O's, so he <laughs> deserves a standing O for that. And just for me hearing you discuss this, like I came, I come from super dysfunctional grandparents, and I come from understanding that alcohol and both sides of my family, lots of alcohol dysfunction. Um, but I know so many people who would dream of hearing someone from your generation talk about being able to get sober and talk about abuse that happened in their families. Cause like you said, it was not discussed. It was not available at all. It's very interesting too, because I had one friend, a childhood friend um, and her birthday was a day after mine. And we, we still are in touch and I always thought her family was perfect, you know, and when our, when, you know, the brown odorous material was hitting the rotating device on high at my house, I'd end up down at her house and, 
you know, thinking that it was all cool beans. Well, when we found each other again after 40 years and she told me the horrors that were going on in her home, I was like, Lord, you know, she, her father was a drinker and her mother was, her mother was horrible. Um, and I was like, wow. So that made me realize, of course, I was older then, but that made me realize those time periods in the 50s and 60s, you know, those were really turbulent times. They really were because women were, you know, women were right on the, it was the feminist movement was, was, was enmeshed with the civil rights movement. Because I don't know how many people know, but it in, it wasn't until 1974 before a woman could have her own credit. Up until that point, a woman could not have credit. It was dependent on, on her husband. And, and that was the role of women back then. The, the role of the woman was to, to manage the home, um, take care of the children, and she had and and to support the community in some way and it was usually through church um or a fraternal organization um but there was no you didn't they didn't think about feelings they didn't think about what their personal goals were or their personal at they didn't have them so here's my mother finally got divorced in 1963 when when um you know divorce is still relatively new and the only grounds for divorce at that time are um mental cruelty and adultery or if they left those were the only things and my mother's grounds were mental cruelty and um so here we are, this staunch Catholic family with this woman who now is divorced. And the church at that time didn't recognize divorce. So basically, the message to my mother was, you know, we understand, but you're going to fry in hell once you die, and you're going to be there for eternity. Okay, so what does somebody do with that? Not to mention now she has to go outside and work and she's a divorcee, which, you know, that's all. So there's all this stuff on top of all the trauma that we've all endured. And, you know, my mother turned to alcohol and she died driving drunk when she and she died. Yeah, she was 47. I was 21 when I lost my mom. And um, it was so unnecessary. It was so unnecessary. But she was one of one of many, you know. Um, what a pioneer, too, you know, to just be able to create that much change in her lifetime. That's hard. And that's not an easy thing to do. And the fact that she did it is incredible. And not even that. But, you know, the credit card thing is one thing. But there were no protections against domestic violence. There was none. There was none because basically a man could do whatever he wanted and there was no repercussion. Yeah. And so I think sometimes that I get frustrated with, <laughs> with modern young women sometimes because when I see where their focus is and how much freedom they have and take for granted and abuse and they don't have any any thought about what their grandmothers went through for them to be able to do those things that they're doing today um you know i don't dwell so on recent it. it's so recent it is so recent because we didn't even get sexual harassment laws till the mid 80s like there's so much that you know even yeah yeah, we could keep going. And domestic violence wasn't even a federal crime until 94. I was going to say. So that's like, what, 20 years? 30? Yeah, 90. 30 no. now, but yeah, 30. not long. No, no. 
And now what we see- Grand scheme of the world and women, my gosh. And and now what we see happening in the world right now, it could slide right back to that in a heartbeat. I mean, that's how fragile it is. That's how fragile, I mean, it's already being talked about. So it, and I don't even know how many women are really aware of that. I mean, there's a, there's a difference between becoming aware of what's happening around us and being absorbed in what's happening around us, you know? Good point. So, um, because you can't, you can't aim your arrow if you don't know what, (laughs) what the surrounding, you know, what your (sighs) peripheral looks like, you know? So just knowing that, then you can advocate because we all need to advocate. We have to advocate for ourselves, but myself, I am, I'm an advocate for mental health, especially for women's mental health. So, um, because I've struggled with my mental health my entire life and I didn't realize until I was a mother that half of my problems were because of unaddressed mental health issues. So, um, how are you brave enough to start figuring that out? I beg your pardon? Said, how were you brave enough to start figuring that out? I didn't have a choice Conscious of it. Okay. I didn't have a choice because I was drinking and, um, the first, and, and I ended up having to be hospitalized for the first time in 1986 because I was suicidal. Um, my depression was over the top and I was, I needed to detox from the alcohol. So, but that was at a time too, where um, I was part of a very, a very um, structured, I'll use the term, a structured religious organization. And, um, you know, they were very much by the Bible and the Bible shuns drunkenness. So what do we do with her? <laughs> so what did they do with you? <laughs> I don't know. They, they, it was like a, an ongoing theme in my life. You know, my family didn't know what to do with me. Um, and now here I was with this, with this issue, which again, You know, back in those days, and and it still is today, but not as bad with stigma around alcoholism in women. It's not the same. You know, the view of an alcoholic woman versus an alcoholic man was not the same. I mean, the man was given a lot more grace than the woman. You know, the woman, it was all shame. You know, look at what she's done to her family and her kids. And, you know, she should have known better. And But but meanwhile, she's got no support. So what is she supposed to do? Anyways, so um, what did they do with me? I guess I was more making a joke. What did you learn during those times? I, I, that's when I really started learning about, um, the impact that my family life had on me. And, um, because I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't understand the impact that it, that it had. So that was the beginning. And it was actually at that time, there was a a very, um, it was a new book. It came out in 94. I think I have it on the shelf. Let me just grab it. Sure. Yeah, 94 was not that long ago. And it's incredible how much we have evolved and how much we have not. And then the amount of pressure that comes with that. 
because I can't I, massive growth growth I, since then. I can't find it, but it was it was new mood therapy. And I think Burns was the name of the doctor, but it was the first time that that the medical community was was able, they were starting to link body, mind, and spirit together. And they were starting to talk about how our thoughts affect our emotions. And so that was really, that was really huge, that book. And then there was another book called You Can't Afford the Neg um, the luxury of a negative thought. So, you know, like at the end of the 80s, the beginning of 90s, people were making that correlation. So I naturally just started looking at my thinking. And there was a lot. Oh, my gosh. I remember when I first read about all or nothing thinking, I'm like, oh, man, that's how I've operated my whole life. But it was interesting because it really showed me the toxic environment that I grew up in and and the thinking patterns and how they um, how they affect our emotional state. And when our emotional state is affected, it affects our choices and what we choose and what we choose affects the quality of our life. So that was the beginning was was being able to recognize that, I call it mental domino theory. <laughs> what you think affects how you feel, how you feel affects what you do, what you do affects the quality of your life. So um Sense to me. It was pretty simple. Um but the the trauma was so deep and the trauma was so severe that it took a long time. It took a really long time. Um and up until the time I was 65, I was hospitalized four times at different points in my life because, you know, I'd go and I'd get a handle on the drinking a little bit. And, you know, then I didn't have the coping skills. And so I would slide back and then it would snowball. And the thing about alcoholism too, that a lot of people don't talk about is that it's a progressive disease. So if, when you, when you stop and then you start again, you don't go back to square one, like when you were 14, <laughs> you know, if your alcoholism has progressed to a point where say you're now, you were blacking out before, before you stopped, if you start drinking again, you're going to start blacking out again, and it's only going to get worse from there. So um, I don't advise trying it because I've lived it and it works. It, and that's part of the reason that, you know, it's not a big reason, but it's in the back of my mind why I don't think that I will choose it again, because I don't think I have another recovery in me. I really don't because of where I where I was in the stream of the disease when I quit the last time. So, um, and it took discipline. I was always a very spiritual person. I mean, we were raised Catholic, you know, and it was the, you know, the whole nine yards. We had to wear, you know, you dressed up, God forbid you weren't dressed up to go to church and you know, we wore the doilies on their heads and the fish on Friday thing. And, you know, um, the whole rituals and all of that stuff. Um, but um, but it, it wasn't that. It wasn't all that pomp. I felt a real connection. I felt a real connection to something greater than myself for a very long time. And I... I think the first time I remember, I remember that feeling, I was probably four or five years old. And I remember being in my bedroom and I heard this noise and I was petrified. I was terrified because it was a noise I didn't recognize. And I heard my father out, out there and I didn't know if somebody was dead. I didn't know. I mean, I was truly petrified because of the things that I had witnessed anything was possible. And I didn't 
there was no place for me to go. There was nobody there. And I remember crawling under the covers all the way to the end where the blankets get tucked in underneath. And I remember just huddled in that space and praying to, you know, what it I just knew was God at that time because of being Catholic. But it was, you know, just help me be able to do your will, to do, let me fulfill my purpose. That's basically what I was praying for. And so I've always had that connection and I didn't know anything different. So I, Christianity and, you know, the Bible and all of that stuff, I view very, very strongly as truth. So, um, so I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses for, for over 20 years. Um, I am grateful for that time because I did that time. I learned a lot. I needed to have people in my life that were semi function, were functional or seemed functional and um, to teach me how to be a mother and a wife. And I mean, I needed real life positive examples to help me know what I was supposed to be doing. And um, I met a lot of very nice people. Um, I learned a lot of things. I learned a lot about the Bible. I learned a lot about public speaking. I learned a lot about teaching and studying, studying and teaching. Um, but it got to a point where I didn't feel like, I don't feel like I have the arrogance of heart to say what is absolute truth because there's so much out there that we don't know and can't explain. And, um, you know, there's a lot of other things too behind control of people through, you know, religious means. It's been done for centuries. Um, and it just doesn't, didn't work for me anymore. And, um, I really don't know that I want to be a part of an organized religion right now because I don't think any of us has that truth because there's so much out there. But I'm not going to go into that because everybody everybody has their own. And to me, to me, God is whatever you connect with as as the source of life period you know because we all are spirit i love that we are all spirit and we are all connected to that that source of spirit source and nothing is going to ever separate us from that how we relate to that is a very individual thing so i mean i can't say to one person that what you're doing is wrong you know, because I was there too. And, but as my relationship developed, so did my need for, um, I didn't need to be part of that type of an organization anymore because it didn't work for me. It didn't, it didn't set with what was, was my connection. So I guess that, that's one thing. I just wish people would be more tolerant of each other in that respect, because there's a lot of people out there that don't have a connection and they don't even want a connection. And a lot of that is because of what's been. And, you know, so. And it's such a beautiful example of like holding space for yourself during certain times and making the best of it and learning what's there for you. So like that might have not have been your end all be all religion. And then you might have decided, I don't really even want a religion, which is great. You know, it's like you said, it's all about let's do what's best for us. But that doesn't mean that that time was wasted. Doesn't mean you didn't learn a ton of stuff. Doesn't mean you didn't connect with amazing people. And sometimes I think we are meant to weave and have different chapters and different spaces in order to expand and open our mind and it's find all, you know our inner truths. It's called growth. 
It's called growth. So we outgrow clothes, we outgrow things, you know, as we grow mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, we outgrow certain people, places, and things because the vibration isn't the same, you know, and I have to admit, I did, I used to feel really uncomfortable knocking on people's doors, you know, and part of the reason that, and it was a requirement and, um, and there was an hourly requirement back then too. And, you know, it just always made me feel uncomfortable because I felt like, I don't know, I felt like I was imposing on somebody's right to choose. Mm. you know um, but then on the other hand I met some really nice people and we had some really nice studies and learnings too so it was it, it's all about grow everything everything is all about growing we can choose to grow or not but if we don't grow anything that doesn't grow withers and anything that withers eventually dies. So, I mean, and it's a choice. It's a choice. And sometimes it's hard because it's easier to fold. It's easier to, you know, it's easier to <laughs> pick up a glass of wine and drink until you want to go to sleep than it is to sit for those many hours it would take to drink and and get sober and just sit there and feel the discomfort through to the other side um you know i i don't like sitting with it any more than anyone else but if i don't sit with it it's not going to leave me mm -hmm. it's going to stay there so, i think this is a good um opportunity to bring up your concept of the should master What's the should master and what can you tell people about that? Well, when I was growing up that everybody lived by the should master, you know, it, it's living by other people's expectations. You know, the woman should do be doing this. The mother should be doing that. You, it's, it's like this whole model of behavior that's dictated it's all and it's all unreal it's all focused on being unreal it's all being unreal don't show you shouldn't cry men shouldn't cry you shouldn't cry why why you know um oh my god here's one women should never wear pants <laughs> yeah i my mother and my grandmother are the only two women i have ever known that never owned a pair of jeans i never saw those women in a pair of jeans never i believe never. it 100 that was a big deal so it it's dict and the dict and the the rules came from they came from society and they came from religion and if you really want to, if you really want to examine them very closely, they were all designed to control, to control an agenda, whoever's agenda it was. And at the end of that agenda, there was always a dollar sign if you looked far enough. Hundred percent. And it's the same today. Yep. It's the same today. And there's. You know, it, it's, I, we live in an unreal world with people that are living unreal lives and who are being unreal human beings because they have the should master scroll in their back pocket and they live by it. You know, I should be married by 30. I should have kids by this time. And if I don't have kids, then, you know, there's something wrong with me. You know, if I, yeah, it goes on and on and on. 
And it's very interesting as I'm speaking, when I'm thinking about it, all those should masters are not looking at themselves. They're looking at everyone else. That's very true. So, you know, and what are they accomplishing for the, you know, what is a should master accomplishing for themselves? Nothing. They're not growing. They're not the anxiety anxiety of of the potential. Well, they're imploding. Mm -hmm. They're imploding. And we're seeing it in every, every system that we have learned to rely on as human beings in a society. It's imploding one after another. And the dominoes are starting to go down faster and faster. And yet there's still people that aren't alarmed by it or aren't, or maybe that's the wrong use of words because people are alarmed by it, but they're paralyzed. Yeah, can't even tune in. Can't even put put the channel on. They're paralyzed because, and they don't know what, they're just paralyzed. And when the only th- thing they need to do is stop, breathe, and listen to their spirit. Mm. And to pay attention to what's showing up in their life. You know, I got to a point where I didn't know what to do. And then things started happening. Butterflies started showing up. This was like 2004, 2005. I mean, butterflies were showing up. I was dancing with them in the driveway. I mean, I was, it was to the point that people were associating me with butterflies and feathers. I was finding all over the place. People would find feathers. They'd bring them to me. um, A butterfly and they'd send it to me. So that's when I started looking. That's when I started looking at symbolism because like I said earlier I've always been very interested in sociology anthropology and all of that stuff indigenous because I've viewed that about as close to the truth as you're going to get you know and people are people so I just started researching totem animals and spirit animals and um really started paying attention to what was showing up into my in my life and it would blew me away every stinking time. Every time it was right, it was spot on. And to so this day, was, almost every time I talked to Denise, she's like, This animal came to visit me. And it was exactly what I was doing <laughs> with my head. And I'm like, yes. uh, They're just one of your number one languages. And it's so important because they show up for so many people to help connect us. Yeah. And it, it, it's like, I think that strengthened my, that began strengthening my, my connection with spirit and my, you know, my, with, with my, my connection to source of life, because I was seeing, and it was, it was like helping me remember that this was the way it always was for me, even as a child, because when stuff, when the first thing I would do is I'd leave the house and I'd be outside all day long. I don't remember a lot of stuff, but I remember I I was outside. I was outside all the time. So, um, so I was still one of Jehovah's Witnesses at that time too. So as I'm gradually learning more about indigenous um, practices and thoughts, I'm thinking, you know, this really isn't going to (laughs) work. So, you know, it's not going to be accepted. They're going to boot me out anyway. It was a lovely 20 years. I must follow the crowd. (laughs) Me out anyway. So I might as well just, they never did boot me out. Mm. Um, But, you know, they, they would disassociate people that didn't follow the practices. But, I know for some reason they, I, I never was officially, I was never officially that disassociated. You built but, an energetic bridge of love. But I don't know. I just, like I said, I don't have the arrogance of heart to say what's absolute truth. Yeah. 
and and if you really take the time to study the history of religions and how certain religious texts came into being and you know the imperfectness of humans and their play in all of it you know how serious do you really want to take all of that i mean how how literal do you want to take all of that or do you want to just use it as something you would find on an archaeology archaeological dig you know where this is a really useful piece of information but it's not it's not the only one piece of information that I need to to base my life on it's one of many and if I if I look at different things you know if I look at different different other you know, cultures and, and indigenous people and their their thoughts and ideas of of source of life and and all of that stuff, you're gonna find that it's all pretty connected. You know, it's all pretty connected. The one thing that that the one thing that I see more so in indigenous though is there's more of there's more of a connection to the earth and there's more of a connection to, there's more connection to the real as opposed to the unreal. And, and there's no should master in indigenous. It just is because it's, because there's a, I mean, granted they had their issues too, but there was a purity about it because I don't know that there was the, I, I don't know. I just personally feel that there's a more purity to it. Well, I also feel for me, what I've noticed, it was more, there seems to be more of an honor and an understanding of being part of nature and that, you know, we are nature and part of nature, whereas certain thoughts and thought groups don't believe that and that we are superior or conquer nature. And I feel like that, that's part of the real for me. But also too, there it that everything is connected. Yeah. I, I I really felt like with the religions that I was a part of, there was there was a lot of separation. There it it, it was marked by separation. There it, there's the us and the uh, you know us and them. You know you're either saved or you're not saved. You're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. There was no. Yeah, it yeah. And I'm sure even with the indigenous there was was judgment, but there was a more it, it it always felt more inclusive because it was a connection of everything. It was a connection of the physical world and the spiritual world. They weren't separate. But what do I hey, we're still evolving and growing and inviting in more and more guides and possibilities and information and knowledge and advancing, you know, even that, even indigenous cultures and other things, you know, it's hard to tell. There's some some history or history written about it, but it's hard to tell sometimes what the truths were. And all we know is what we're dealing with now and the energies we're dealing with now and how can we heal and evolve from there. I want to ask, oh, go ahead. You all I know, all I know is that my entire life, as far as spiritually goes, I've always had felt a very strong connection. And I've always, I've always wanted to be a ripple in a pond. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to just be that rock that just goes down in ripples and that whatever ripples out from me, that goes to another, that it will ripple out from them. And that whatever those ripples are, are going to be in the best interest or what is needed at that moment for the greatest good. And that's all I've ever cared about. I haven't cared about whether Jesus is God or not, or, you know, whatever it's, it's always for me been about taking what I have to offer, to pay forward to life for, for being here to, to help further the greatest good of whatever. And that's that's it for me. I honor that a lot. I do want to ask you about vivacious living and becoming real. Will you tell us a little bit about that? 
Mm-hmm. Well, around the time that I, the butterflies and the feathers, and that was really actually my my first my the first recognizable phase let's put it that way the first recognizable phase of a spiritual awakening Mm -hmm. um the the book by sue monk kid called dance of the dissident daughter was what changed my life on that if anybody's interested she was um very i i don't know if she was if it was baptist but she was very very I don't want a strict religious background and stuff and her breaking away from that. And that really, really helped too. So it was about that time I had read that book, the butterflies and the feathers and everything were coming in. My grandmother had passed away. She was the one that had raised me. So I was entering a new phase of life and I had an epiphany that um, and it was based on the Velveteen Rabbit, the story of the Velveteen Rabbit. And there was a scene in the Velveteen Rabbit where um, they're in the nursery and there's a toy called the skinned horse. And he was a very old toy and had been there a long time. And the Velveteen Rabbit was having a conversation with him about what it meant to be real. And when I read that, it made me realize that we are all a work in progress and that, you know, we're okay where we are. And as long as we're, as long as we're, we're growing, we're doing the work. So Um, I wrote, um, I wrote a poem around that time and I, I designed a pin of a woman and, oh, there she is. But back, the original one didn't, her legs were bound, which was very interesting. I never thought of that until somebody eventually told me about that. And then I freed her legs back in. 2021 I think um but yeah it says a real it the first verse was a real woman I changed it to a real human in 21 because I wanted to open it up to more people but the real woman is a work in progress as body mind and spirit are nurtured into harmony it benefits one and all real is not how she is made it's something she's able to become A real woman is resourceful, empowered, authentic, vivacious. A real woman has heart. So after I read that that story and I realized that I was a work in progress, I came up with that acronym for real, which was to be resourceful, empowered, authentic, and vivacious. And vivacious was a word, isn't a real word. It's one I made up. Um, it's in this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, I was a reading teacher for a number of years, so I love words. Um, so I looked at, looked up the roots and everything. And live, one definition for live is real time. So it's in the moment. And the word aceous means full of. So livacious means full of the moment. So as I'm looking at, you know, the evolution of myself and becoming real, I had to start looking at my resources, you know, and if you were to ask me what the most valuable resource I have, I would have to say it's my mind because it creates my world. So I had to start looking at resources that you wouldn't normally think are resources Um, And then empowerment, healthy empowerment, how to use those resources to empower myself, you know, and, and a person to me, a person that's empowered is a very, is a force, but they're a peaceful force. They're not an aggressive force. They're a peaceful force. At least that's what I feel. 
Um, I honor that because I feel like in order to be empowered, you kind of have to have, you have to have a good amount of control over your power. You have to have grace. You truly embody it. Yeah. And to be empowered. You have to have, you have to have grace. And, and in order to have grace, you have to face your shadow. Because if you can't face your shadow and learn from your shadow and embrace your shadow, ain't going to happen. So, um, at least I haven't found a difference around it. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, you, there's the escapism, but you still have to, I should say a non-toxic way around it. Cause there's like all these things, you know, you can, whether it's just scrolling or running or alcohol or food or whatever it is, you know, it's going to still be there. Those it's options gonna... are there. A lot of times it's work for people. A lot of times it's career and building the should master list. You know, look, it did. It, I did it for almost 40 years. I mean, I had my little spurts and I would grow in between times, but I, I, I slipped back. Um, yeah. I mean, it's all a choice. It's all a choice. And people don't want to hear that either because they, because if, if, if you say, if you say you've got a choice, then that removes the ability to blame anybody or to not take responsibility. And I get it because some of this stuff is pretty heavy stuff and you don't want to the responsibility, but in order to get to the other side, you got to take the responsibility. And a lot of times it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. You know, um, I remember, I remember going to AA and I, it did, AA didn't work for me because I found it too shaming on some levels, but I found this group called um, Women for Sobriety which was um, founded by a woman named Jean Kirkpatrick. And um, it was, she took all those steps in and tweaked them. But one of the things that she said was, um, the things that we worry about, 99% of the things, let's see, how did she put it? Of all the, while well, the things we worry about, only 1% of it happens. So like 99% of what we worry about doesn't happen. It's only like 1%. And I was like, wow. And I really thought about that. And that was really huge. And I still use that today, um, especially because of, of my trauma. I can go pretty pretty fast um and then I have to just bring myself back but I was I gonna ask you to follow up on that what are some things because trauma PTSD complex PTSD it's something many of us are always healing in our own ways in our own corners what are some things that help you to bring yourself back or to breathe during those times well art art has always been it's always been even since I was a kid and it's been my second language because, um, you know, sometimes there's things that we need to, we need to process or release that there are absolute, no words for them. They're bigger than words, but they can come out in images. They can come out in scribbles. They can come out in, in whatever. I remember when, a, when I first started therapy, it was back in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties. And I was seeing this this person and we were getting nowhere and I was feeling really frustrated and it was another one of those situations what do we do with her and so I decided to make a collage and I entitled it this child's view of life and I set up the picnic table because I had a porch I set up a picnic table and I got my poster board, I got a shoe box and a bunch of magazines. And I spent a few weeks just looking through magazines and just intuitively picking out, you know, ripping stuff out that spoke to me for whatever reason. Got the glue stick, I got everything I was had had the pro procrastination dance down to a science. 
because I was, I had, I was, I had this plan, but I was also petrified because I didn't know what, what doing this was going to bring up for me. And I'd heard all these horror stories of people having flashbacks and, you know, past memories coming back. And, and I really didn't want to, wasn't looking forward to that. So I eventually started. And all I have to say is once I started working on it, I felt like something was caressing me from the inside out. That is the only way I can describe it. And I was at the point where I was looking, I looked forward to working on it. And I mean, I'm telling you, I took family photos. I took my, my parents' wedding picture and I ripped it in half and that was put in there. I mean, family, yeah. So, and I finished it and I brought it to her and brought it to my, my counselor so that we could use it as a springboard for my therapy. <laughs> So, but it was very interesting because the very last, I remember it like it was yesterday, the very last picture I put, it was on the bottom right corner. I had found a picture of a child with ratty hair. It was just the back of them. They had ratty hair and, you know, oversized dirty flannel shirt and they had this ratty were carrying this ratty teddy bear and I found words that said change what you can and learn to love the rest and I remember putting that as the last thing on that collage and just sobbing and crying and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and so I guess that was that was really, I think, the beginning of my, because that was before even being in the hospital the first time. So that was really the beginning of my my healing journey and working with my shadow, even though I didn't realize it at that time. But it was a, it was really powerful, and from that moment on, I realized how important art is in healing trauma um and i used it i used it for myself all these years and then up until um a couple of years ago um i started offering it to other people to see if it would benefit for benefit them and i've just been very very I'm not surprised, but I'm very pleased to see the effect that it has on other people. And it's something that I can give. It's it's like, <clears throat> it's something I can pay forward for the people that were in my life during the times that my healing journey, the people that showed up when I needed them to show up. Um, and you know, through my, through, through the, the intuitive art um, facilitation, I can offer people a tool to help them become resourceful, to help them become empowered so that they can be authentic and live vivaciously. Um, and the great thing about it is that it's not expensive. It's it's not expensive. It all it takes is some time. You could go to the dollar store and buy a an eight thing of Crayola watercolors and a paintbrush and some, you know, or or whatever it is, whatever how whatever creativity speaks to you, do it. Because I've done a lot of things. I just ended up ended up um, surprisingly with watercolor, which I never never expected because I started painting in two thousand. 2005 and I had never picked up a brush but I felt whatever needed to come out of me had to come out in water and color so I did and here we are I so know. I love that but yeah I think the whole goal is learning to to live in the moment because this is the truth this is the truth the absolute truth. 
All of us only have control of three things at any point in time. What we think, what we do, and this moment. That's it. That's all we have control over at any time. So I have to remember that when I'm going into what's going to happen when I'm 75 and, you know, this, that, and the other thing and my, my security, that's my challenge. Because as I'm getting older, I'm getting, I'm becoming more vulnerable like a child because that's the cycle of life. So um, my challenge right now is just trusting that what I need is gonna come into my experience when I need it. And, um, and just ride the wave of emotion. So, but it helps having people um, around. It helps having supportive people around and And spirit. Yeah. That connection to spirit, man. The people help for sure, but would you say that it's it helps a lot more to have that connection outside of yourself too? Yeah. Because sometimes things feel really heavy. You know, things can feel really heavy and then you see a butterfly. And it was really interesting because we were talking earlier before we started that butterfly that I was telling you about that showed up after a prayerful request for visible, <laughs> visible support. Um, I didn't know if that it was, it was like over 90 in the environment that butterfly was in. And I didn't know if it was alive, if it was dying or if it was resting. And I didn't want to touch it because I didn't want to weaken it. But I went in the house and I got a sponge and I put a little honey and some water to dilute it and put the sponge down on the floor and it didn't want anything to do with it. So I just let it be and went in the house thinking like in two hours, I'm going to go out and the thing's going to be dead. And I went out and it was gone. And I looked on the other side of the door and it was outside in the flower pot outside on the other side. So, you know, when things like that happen, it happens, it lightens my spirit. It also, I think what I learned from that experience too was, you know, when you think of something vulnerable, there's nothing more vulnerable or fragile than a butterfly. You know, and yet at the same time, the power and the strength too, you know, it's like, I don't know, life is, is a very wonderful, wonderful thing and a very fragile thing and a very perplexing thing, <laughs> but Oh. it's all of those and more yeah all of those and more so denise you are an expressive art facilitator how can people follow you get a hold of you work with you you're going to be offering a support soul circle with sea goddess healing art soon you teach one-on-one -on -one sessions within your home and at a retreat center nearby so how do you like people to get a hold of you and follow you and what are some things you're offering well, I am on Facebook and you can, you could get me through the, the Sea Goddess community. That's probably, since this is where it is, you could get me through there. I'm actually just starting out. So I don't know how it's going to, how it's going to roll. I'm open. I'm open to anything. Um, I really wanted to do this support circle and my thoughts are that if people are part of it and they enjoy it, if it would be something that they would like to have monthly and I could, we could have people request ideas for themes that they'd want to 
want to do. Um, this one that we're having now is um, going to be on support. I do have a little um, our activity that I'm not going to do, but I will present that if people want want to do it after as an extension of of the circle for themselves, they can. Um, we'll have that as an add-on bonus. So you know that's what I what I'd like to do. I I, I really want to just empower people. I want to empower people to be able to work through, you know, find ways of, of working, not only just working through their emotions, but, you know, a lot of times the art, I've learned so much about myself through it that I didn't expect to learn. So it's just another tool for, for growing and becoming more authentic. Um, I would love to do more groups. I would love to have conversation um, and support. And if anyone want, would want to just talk to me one-on-one -on -one or whatever, I'm open to whatever. I'm available. You taught, you taught us a workshop at the retreat. What was that? Um, I did. The, the group workshop was a neurographic drawing workshop where we, um, we focused on an intention that we wanted to release and then did the drawing and then everybody did their drawings and painted them and then we put them together as a paper quilt to see the energy of um the group and because we could see each other's individual but to see it as a group was was pretty cool so, you know i I don't know if that could that could easily be done online. Uh, well, we can certainly chat more and more about that. But Denise has so many offerings that she does teach one-on-one -on -one sessions in Vermont at her house. And then um, you're going to be offering that at the retreat center that is close by as well. What are you going to be offering there? One-on-one -on -one art sessions also, right? Yeah, I'm going to be doing um, the one-on-one -on -one and also I'm going to be doing um, groups. And maybe I'll do it, um, give that information to you later on, because this place is, um, it's, it's beautiful. There's over 470 acres there. And basically, basically. Um, people can rent the place out. They have practitioners there. I mean, if you wanted to schedule a retreat there, personal retreat or a group retreat or a wedding or anything there, you can. And they have practitioners that you can choose from anywhere from yoga to um, energy healing to sound healing to I'm there. Um, but you can also rent a place out just for yourself and bring your own stuff in there and do what you want. So exactly. And we are going to link that in this show. What's the name of it? It's called wild trails farm. Wild Trails Farm, where you can plan your own personal retreat or rent out space to organize or host your own retreat, which is pretty. Right. So right. Denise has her own workshop. She has that space. And then she does teach online, too. We did a wonderful intention box workshop. And you've taught several things over over the Zoom and the ethers now um, that have been incredible. Well, thank you for that. And I appreciated the opportunities. And I'm this is all real new to me. I mean, I can't believe what's happened in a year. And um, so we're just, I'm just seeing what works as we go along. So. It's funny because I think some of it's new for you. It's just my perspective because you're so wise and you've been teaching for so long and you've done art your whole life that now just adding in this part is the new part, I think. But so much of it is within you. And no matter what we're talking about and whenever we're holding space, you always have so much to share and teach. And I just think this next chapter is going to be just so beautiful and you deserve it. Well, I'm excited if I could just get the technology piece. See, the, the technology piece is is my is my um, my Achilles heel because I, I you guys are all you grew up with it all. You know, so, but I just, so that's where I'm just trusting that the right. I'm just going to give you a whole lot of credit because you make it work. You hopped in on this, no problem. And when I went over to Denise's, we did the intention box in person. 
I was with Denise in Vermont, but then we did it online and she had several cameras set up and different projections going on <laughs> with the, um, and it ended up being perfect with the different computers and lighting. So I know you got this and you'll continue to learn and evolve and grow that space and it's needed and people love, need, and deserve art therapy. So I'm just, I'm honored to know you and I'm so glad you're gifting it to humanity at this time. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Denise, are you on Instagram? You know, I am, but I don't, I haven't been using it because I don't really know how, but I do have an account and I guess I'm going to have to look into that. <laughs> oh, I know people like to follow on Instagram and on Facebook. So I know you mentioned you I am, on, Fa I am on Facebook. Um, and you can find Denise via our emails and through our Facebook community. Thank you so much for taking this time and sharing parts of your heart and soul, and especially the heart's parts, especially the salt water that cleanses out the wounds, because a lot of times it stings a little, but we need to do it. It helps us. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Mandy. My honor. <laughs>